Hello, let's talk about The Skin of Our Teeth by Thornton Wilder. So in the global context, uh, the Great War, as we know it is World War I, started when a Serbian assassinated the Archduke of Austria-Hungary. And Austria-Hungary declared war on Serbia. And due to this complex web of allegiances uh, with all these treaties and allies and so forth, most of the world's powers were drawn into the war. Uh, in 1917, the U.S. joined on the side of the Allies, Russia, France, and Britain. And uh, this war was uh, brutal and bloody. Uh, in the world of literature, this war challenged notions of sort of the romantic concept of, of war, uh, the fair idea of fairness and, and, and concepts of masculinity. Uh, in America during the Roaring Twenties, the economy was booming. And uh, Charles Lindbergh, the aviator, was a national celebrity. And uh, jazz music was everywhere. Uh, Babe Ruth was setting records in baseball. Women got the right to vote. And among the first things that they did when they got the right to vote was to vote to prohibit alcohol. And uh, if you've read The Great Gatsby, you know all about the fancy cars and uh, the American dream and the class structure. Um, uh, in the next decade, in the 1930s, we have, well, it, it starts with the, the stock crash, the stock market crashed in 1929, and uh, the, the Great Depression, there was also a drought in the United States that added to the problem, um, and uh, uh, unemployment, and a global unrest, uh, if the rise of fascism in Europe, and uh, that leads directly in the 1940s to uh, World War II. It started in uh, Europe in 1939. Um, World War II, the main antagonists were actually the same. Uh, Italy and Germany on the Axis side and France and Great Britain uh, on the side of the Allies. In uh, uh, 1941, the uh, U.S. joined when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. Also in 1941, Germany uh, attacked its ally, Russia, and uh, Russia flips sides. Uh, in, in the midst of all of this, um, in 1942, Wilder is writing The Skin of Our Teeth. Uh, it, it's in the middle of the war, and Act 3 of this play involves uh, uh, how do you build a society that recovers after the war is over? Uh, in 1944, the Allies storm the beaches at Normandy and start uh, putting the Nazis on defensive. About, about a year later, Hitler commits suicide in his bunker. And about a week after that, the Axis forces uh, surrender in Europe. In 1945, a few months after the, the surrender in Europe, uh, the war in the Pacific ends when America drops two atomic bombs on Japan. And shortly after that, uh, they surrender. In the American context at the time, um, uh, propaganda in uh, America, uh, it, there's certainly plenty of propaganda against the Nazis, but this is an, an illustration uh, showing a, a, a cartoon demonized uh, a Japanese figure um, you know, assaulting a very, very pale skinned woman. This really um, uh, uh, caused uh, uh, on the home front, uh, this propaganda caused uh, some civilian panic. And uh, uh, on the right, you see a, a bomb shelter. That's really more of a 1950s bomb shelter uh, to, to sort of defend against a nuclear attack. But in the 1940s, uh, ordinary Americans who were uh, afraid of air raids uh, did build shelters in, the, in their backyards. Uh, in 1942, uh, wartime shortages, I mean, because so many factories had stopped producing consumer goods and were producing wartime goods, um, uh, there were shortages of things at home, uh, rubber and uh, coffee and things like that. And um, uh, people built victory gardens uh, on the um, roofs of their houses. Uh, here we have children uh, in, in an, an urban setting that uh, the average American could help win the war by planting vegetables. And um, uh, we also have in this time period with all the men, uh, so many men off to war, uh, women took the men's places in factory jobs. And so we have the, the Rosie the Riveter character and a lot of women uh, doing these working class factory jobs. Um, the uh, uh, propaganda films, uh, we have here Donald Duck in a, a Nazi themed propaganda film. Uh, and, you know, I mean, d d to us in this day and age, maybe these, these Disney propaganda films are more of a curiosity. 
But at the time period, the propaganda, uh, which included anti-Japanese content in order to sort of stoke people up for the war in the Pacific, uh, that led to um, internment camps, which were really concentration camps where uh, uh, Japanese Americans, American citizens uh, whose uh, parents or who, who themselves came from Japan were, were rounded up. And here we have children uh, living behind barbed wire uh, with, a, you know, with a, a guarded uh, tower. This is in, uh, in America, on American soil, in the, the, the home of the free. Um, here we have American citizens uh, behind barbed wire because of the um, uh, color of their skin. Now, in America, the theatrical context, um, well, uh, you have to understand theater at that time exists in a world where uh, movies in the 1920s and 1930s, uh, they were silent and black and white. And in the 1940s, Hollywood was having its golden age. I think 1940 was, was considered Hollywood's uh, golden age. And Broadway theater was uh, competing for the same audiences and uh, Broadway was able to use sound and, and live music and uh, color uh, in order to compete with those audiences. Uh, in the uh, 1940s, uh, Broadway musicals were th thriving, but uh, drama suffers. That is, serious theater suffers. And even in the context where theater was economically struggling, um, uh, America really showed some some uh, world class talent with Tennessee Williams. Uh, it, it's, it's a screenshot from um, uh, the Glass Menagerie, uh, Thornton Wilder um, uh, with Our Town and also The Skin of Our Teeth, and uh, Arthur Miller um, with um, All My Sons in in the the uh, uh, late forties. And these plays involved the the nuclear family dealing with the the, the wartime home front in, in in certain in certain ways um different ramifications but that was a a very common theme uh, the individual uh the sort of you know a uh, lone cowboy american uh dream character uh, against the, the the good of the family and the good of the community and the the, the greater good of humanity Theater of uh, this time period often relied heavily on projections and meta theater, that is, characters reminding the audience that they are watching a play. Uh, many other popular plays at the time period would alternate between uh, deeply realistic psychological dramatizations of events and then something would happen that would deliberately remind the audience that they were watching a play. And certainly, The Skin of Our Teeth is, is very good at doing that. Thornton Wilder himself, born 1897 and lived until 1975. As a young man, Thornton Wilder was teased for being overly intellectual. Uh, he went to uh, World War I, enlisted, uh, and became a corporal. Uh, he went to Yale and Princeton afterwards and, and did very well as a scholar. Uh, he won three Pulitzer Prizes. In 1927, his play, The Bridge of San Luis Rey, won an award. And uh, he also won the P Pulitzer for Our Town in 1938. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. Uh, he also won for The Skin of Our Teeth. And uh, in World War II, uh, he uh, entered the Air Force uh, Intelligence Branch and rose to the rank of lieutenant colonel. Um, uh, he never married. And uh, uh, although um, there is no evidence whatsoever about his uh, sexuality, uh, there are some rumors that he was homosexual. But really, I think that the, the best evidence is probably that he was asexual. There, there's no uh, uh, credible uh, stories of him having any kind of um, relation with anybody else. In 1938, uh, his play Our Town uh, idealized the uh, ordinary life of ordinary people in a small town. It was a tribute, but it was also a critique. And um, uh, the character, the stage manager, is a narrator who uh, spends at least half the play uh, direct, directly addressing the audience. He sometimes like will put on an apron and glasses and, and play the shopkeeper, or he'll play the, the minister in a wedding ceremony. He'll play these bit parts. Uh, I have a, a certain uh, affection for the character of the stage manager because when I was a, a high school junior, I, I played uh, this character, the narrator in, in our town, and the, the play had a big uh, effect on me. Uh, it follows uh, a very traditional and, and sweet and idealized romance between the, the boy next door and the girl next door. But uh, again, there are common uh, reminders that what we're doing is watching a play, and our town has a tragic turn. 
and uh, the play dramatizes some regrets uh, through the lens of the afterlife. And there's a famous exchange near the end of the play. Um, a, a character who's died says, uh, does anyone ever realize life while they live it every, every minute? And the stage manager very kindly says to her, no, uh, saints and poets, maybe they do some. Anyway, so this was uh, uh, this play had a big effect on me when I uh, performed it when I was about 16. The Skin of Our Teeth, 1942, we have a representative human family. The name Anthropus uh, reminds us of the Greek uh, anthropos, man as in anthropology. The, uh, this play describes this representative human family going through three catastrophes, ice age, flood, and rebuilding a post-war society. Now notice the catastrophe in Act 3 is not war. It's building a new society after the war is over. And it was very optimistic and forward thinking that while the war was going on, um, Thornton Wilder wrote a play about what he thought humans needed in order to recover and pick up the pieces and, and sort of um, uh, rebuild a society after this war ends. The format of the play is absurdist. Uh, Sabina says at one point, I don't understand a word of this play. It shatters stage conventions that the audience uh, would have known pretty well. And uh, I, the uh, character, I said Sabina earlier, but it's really Miss Somerset, the actress who plays Sabina, who says at one point, uh, I don't think the theater is a place where people's feelings ought to be hurt. Uh, this play covers current events. Uh, the audiences would have understood the scarcity and the uh, idea of refugees and the tribalism that and the, the sort of... Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, defending your home and hearth against the whole outside world uh, that Mrs. Antrobus goes through. Uh, and speaking of Mrs. Antrobus, I, I want to talk uh, about the gender roles of this play. And I would say that this play both challenges and upholds uh, traditional views of gender. In an article in the At Atlantic, uh, a quote says um, that women of this time period uh, for centuries a woman's social status was clear cut. Either she had a maid or she was one. It was actually common for a middle class household to have a maid. An uneducated woman had few career options, uh, so they'd often trade their labor for room and board. Uh, they, they weren't that expensive. Uh, even through the 1950s, uh, Sabina, the, the maid, is, is a very complex uh, character at, at one level, she's a, a clever servant, kind of like Lucy in the the, the rivals. Or there's on the character in in uh, Tartuffe that's very similar. Uh, this saucy uh, servant who uh, um, observes what's going on and and tells the audience what she thinks about her betters. Uh, we also hear in the play from Miss Somerset, who is a, the sentimental actress, kind of an ordinary person who plays Sabina in this play. And in Act Two, uh, Sabina, we know her as Lily Fairweather, and I think that's a significant name for uh, an act that focuses on the coming of a storm. Uh, she is the other woman archetype. Uh, we also have uh, Mrs. Anterbus, who is, uh, we understand, is not beautiful, but she's uh, practical and she's loyal, and, uh, and, and, and but also tribal. Uh, we have Gladys, the daughter, who is impressionable and conventional. Uh, she's balanced, however, in, in Act Two, certainly by the fortune teller, who's a, an outspoken outsider uh, who's not at all conventional. So I think this play certainly uh, recognizes and upholds traditional gender roles. Uh, but for a play written in 1942, uh, I think it's far from conventional, and it it, it devotes quite a bit of space to the, the, the plight of, of the women. Now, uh, men have gender too. Uh, Mr. Enterbus is the archetype of the inventor, the leader. The, the, he spends his days thinking great abstract thoughts. Uh, but every time he commutes to the office, he's putting his life at risk in this fantasy setting that Wilder is presented. Um, negative stereotypical traits uh, of men, he's condescending, he's entitled, uh, his 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 manhood is fragile. You know, they all don't upset your father. You know, your father couldn't live if he didn't think you were perfect. Um, uh, he's violent. 
uh, he uses violent language. In, in Act 1, it is mostly uh, for comic effect, but he does hit his son a couple times. And um, uh, there's a reference in the play to the, the rape of the Sabine women, a, 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 a Roman myth. Um, now, the word rape uh, originally meant abduction, and I think that's the meaning in which it's used here. But in our 21st century society, uh, the, 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 that particular word has uh, emotional resonances that maybe in 1942, um, uh, it, it would not have been taken uh, directly, this reference to the rape of the Sabine women. Uh, think of it more abduction. Uh, I think we can see uh, Mr. Antrobus um, uh, both uh, reveling in and being restricted by his conventional gender role. In fact, this um, uh, the, the 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 temptation by the other woman scene. Uh, the actors feel that it is so cliche that they they skip the scene. They don't think they even need to bother to perform it. The audience doesn't need to see it. And now, likewise, uh, Henry cannot escape the fact that he is Cain, that is the, the, the son of Adam and Eve who killed his good brother Abel. And uh, Henry at one point is separated from the family and he uh, comes and joins the family on the ark at the end of Act 2 only after his mother acknowledges who he is and calls him by his real name, Cain. And it's very difficult for her, uh, but Henry realizes, um, uh, 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 he says, I didn't think you wanted me when his mother was only calling out to Henry. In Act 3, we learn that Henry is the enemy. The enemy is Henry. Henry is the enemy that um, Antrobus and the, the good characters were fighting against. Uh, he is um, uh, pouty and, and, and defensive, and the stage directions say, uh, insist that the actor portraying him has to portray him in Act 3 as uh, not as a misunderstood child, but as an embodiment of pure evil. And so that's certainly going to define him uh, according to gender stereotypes. Now, Wilder is an artist with great insight into the human condition, uh, but he's also a product of his times. And I think we need to keep both of those factors in mind uh, when we consider gender in his work. I want to talk a little bit about a critical reaction to this play. Um, a, uh, a Catholic writer and critic, uh, who, a reviewer of the original play, Mary McCarthy, uh, to her said the play affirms the eternity of capitalism and offers a kind of bowdlerized version of Christian morality. Uh, to bowdlerize would be like to go through a text and, and every time you see a, a, a cuss word to change it to gall darn it um, uh, instead of God damn it. Uh, so that would be bowdlerizing, um, a, a simplified, a childish version of Christian morality, McCarthy thought. Uh, she saw Wilder's a spoof on history, insisting that the Roman in his toga is simply a bourgeois citizen wearing a sheet, and the Neanderthal with his bare skin and club is at heart an insurance salesman at a fancy dress ball. To McCarthy, the theatrical... Uh, uh, tricks and uh, um, uh, gimmicks in this play, you know, the, 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 the conceits and the innovations, she saw them fraudulent and an illusionist's trick, and she really thought of this as an academic joke. So uh, that was a pretty negative uh, review of, of a play, which, uh, as I mentioned before, won a Pulitzer Prize, and it was really, you know, it was the talk of the town when it came out in the 1940s. Uh, all, all the intellectuals loved this play. It was very popular. Uh, Wilder himself said that the Russians banned the skin of our teeth because they said it equated it with war, equated war with flood and the ice age as natural catastrophes, when every good Marxist knows war is only the work of capitalists. Uh, but Wilder also said that uh, if Americans uh, who were really uh, you know, they certainly suffered during World War II, but they were really isolated from the, the brunt of suffering in, in, in the war. If Americans, who were kind of comfy and safe, thought of it as a parody, uh, the Germans, who really suffered during and after the war, says Wilder, uh, took it with deadly seriousness. Uh, Wilder said, it was a moving experience to have seen this play in Germany soon after the war, in the shattered churches and beer halls that were serving as theaters, with audiences whose price of admission meant the loss of a meal, and for whom it was 
of absorbing interest that there was a recipe for grass soup that did not cause the diarrhea. Um, Wilder, in a tribute to James Joyce, uh, wrote the following. You have lost some husband, brother, or parent in the war. Your grief is very real to you. Yet now we know as never before that a great many died in this war and in the wars of Carthage and Troy and Ur and in the Thirty Years' War. What end is there to any human thing in which you are not also companion to billions? It does not diminish your grief, but it orients it to a larger field of reference. Antrobus asks his children, if you come through this, what will you be able to do? And uh, well, Henry studies the wheel and the multiplication tables, and uh, we know that Gladys studies literature and the Bible, uh, the refugees tear down pickets in the fence to, to feed the fire. And I think that's a very important symbol. Uh, uh, Wilder is not talking about building fences. He's, he asks these refugees to tear down fences so that all of humanity can survive rather than uh, hiding behind a fence that will protect just his own family. Mrs. Antrobus, uh, although she dismisses these philosophers and refugees and thinks they're not all that useful, uh, she does know that the muses uh, will be able to inspire her husband. So she calls on the muses to sing. And we've also talked about how she uh, calls for Cain. She acknowledges uh, the darkness within her own son, Henry, as much as she would like to uh, deny it. Anderbus intends to stray for, from his marriage, uh, but he relents. In a similar way, he intends to kill Henry, but re relents. Uh, Sabina, the maid, threatens to quit, uh, but she never does. So um, I think all the characters learn to compromise, and the family unit and civilization survives. Uh, even Henry's willingness to accept a potato from the family that he says he hates, well, that, that's an admission that he's not self-sufficient. Mr. Antipas moves from a self-important abstract uh, tinkering with the alphabet and the wheel to inventing nutritious grass soup. Uh, and he says he's terrified with living with his former enemy in peacetime. Uh, but again, when he has the chance to kill Henry, he doesn't. And after uh, Mr. Andrebus confiscates the black market beef cubes that Sabina had been hoarding, he grants her one beef cube so she can go to the movies. It's an optimistic, uh, humane message that Wilder is giving us. I, 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 I really happen to love this play uh, for all its flaws, and I hope you can see some connection uh, maybe to Rossum's Universal Robots, which deals with the end of times, and, and to every man, which deals with the end of one person's times, and, and the Cherry Orchard, uh, and, and Oedipus Rex, all of which are plays about how we face what looks like the end. Uh, but these plays afford us, the audience, opportunities to learn and uh, to grow and to understand what it means to be human, even though not all the characters in the play understand what we understand. Uh, as we see this change in Mr. Antrobus, uh, we see he is successfully applying the lessons of those great philosophers uh, under their guidance. He's becoming the great ruler, the self-aware ruler, the principled but empathetic, the, the flawed but humble ruler that Wilder is telling us the human race needs. Uh, once we've survived the latest crisis by the skin of our teeth, uh, and when we find ourselves uh, on the other side ready to build a better society. So, well, with that in mind, uh, for World Drama at Seton Hill University, this is Dennis Jers. Happy reading, and I will see you online.